Today, I will speak about the vital role and the very individual space that museums of art inhabit within cities. I will touch upon some of the challenges for art museums by highlighting what is driving their development, their reinvention, and in one particular case, their decline. A discussion such as this would be incomplete without making reference to Spain's Guggenheim in Bilbao, Hobart's Mona, and of course, the Bendigo Art Gallery. These cultural institutions have demonstrated success at varying levels, so much so that when we talk about art museums or galleries of note, we refer to the Bilbao effect in Spain, closer to home, the Mona factor in Tasmania. And locally, on our own doorstep, we now have some commentators and industry professionals making reference to the Bendigo effect. Established in 1887, Bendigo Art Gallery first encountered the concept of the blockbuster in 1906, when pre-Raphaelite artist Holman Hunt's religious picture, Light of the World, toured the country and attendances for the five-day exhibition here in Bendigo amounted to 17,000 people. Attendance figures like that were not achieved again for over 100 years, with the recent exhibition, Grace Kelly Style Icon, which achieved more than 150,000 people over a 100-day period. An economic study subsequently revealed that Princess Grace exhibition generated $16.3 million into the Victorian economy. Tourist spend through hospitality, accommodation and the like was responsible for this robust result. Ticket sales exceeded original forecasts, so revenue was up and this became a win-win situation for everyone. But a spike in attendances is not a recipe for the future. The good problem that it was at the time has indeed given us much to think about as we strive to be sustainable. I am often asked by my industry colleagues in other municipalities, how can we do a Bendigo? How do we achieve the Bendigo effect? However, I am asked it so often that I have given a great deal of thought, and my answer is this. Communities and relationships make a gallery successful. Without the connectivity within the local community, your institution will become irrelevant. To survive, you must weather the good times and the bad times. The toughest period for Bendigo Art Gallery was probably during the First and Second World Wars. And as post-war Australia rebuilt itself, our gallery emerged with plans to modernise and a creamy brick facade was attached to the 19th century building, which you can now see in View Street. We tore this down, we redeveloped the front of the gallery in the late 1990s, then added a cafe, and now in 2014, we have just completed new gallery spaces, provided better circulation, increased amenities, and importantly, built a 650 square metre underground store to house the important Bendigo collection of over 5,000 pieces. But architecture alone will not sustain us. It is the content, the programming, and the access that we must provide so that people will continue to breathe life into our gallery and keep it relevant. The success of Bendigo Art Gallery has coincided with a reinstated sense of civic pride within the city of Bendigo over the past two decades. Without a doubt, the gallery's successful formula is unique, but slow and steady has built a cultural institution that is now admired and loved by its community. It would be fair to say that the gallery is not part of every Bendigonian's life but certainly its aura and presence will be felt for decades to come. And the once irrelevant and invisible gallery has managed to capture the imagination of locals, of Melburnians, reaching further afield into the subconscious of ordinary Australians. The Princess Grace exhibition helped us achieve this. If you mention you are from Bendigo to a person in Sydney, for example, they may reply by saying, aha, yes, you have the bank, and that marvellous gallery. But what has driven the reputation and profile and how can a cultural institution remain relevant and survive in a technological age, a postmodern era, and indeed this 21st century, when others are struggling to be relevant? 
So we're traveling to Detroit. We're going to look at the Detroit Institute of Arts Museum. When a city is declared bankrupt, in fact, the largest municipal bankruptcy in the United States history with a debt of 18 billion, where does this leave the Museum of Art and its valuable collection? The thought of disposing of a, of a city asset such as this is unthinkable. However, the de desperate nature of this current situation in Detroit has placed the museum in a precarious position, whereby a fire sale is being considered as a way to pay some of the city debts. The division of opinion is being dealt with in the courts as the city struggles with deindustrialization, job losses, loss of investment, loss of tourism, and a fleeing population. Included in the collection are artworks such as, by artists such as Degas, Matisse and Van Gogh, all recently valued for millions of dollars. The museum also has its priceless murals painted by renowned Mexican artist Diego Rivera. But Detroit has changed dramatically since the heyday of the automobile industry's peak and economic turmoil is wreaking havoc. This cultural institution, the DIA, desperately needs its community, or a community. Perhaps to its rescue, philanthropists will pledge enough to save it for future generations. Supporters and community leaders are saying yes to the preservation as the negotiations continue. It is an extreme case, but can the museum save the city? And the city save the museum? Bilbao in Spain, so we're going to the other side of the world. Today's public definitely knows about the Bilbao Guggenheim since its opening in 1997. It has attracted millions of visitors. Once again, the process of deindustrialization and transition to a service city was the driver behind plans in the 1980s that would support the subsequent investment in infrastructure and urban renewal. Located on the Bay of Biscay, Bilbao is the fourth largest city in Spain. By 1991, with new designs for an airport, a transport system, among other important projects on the drawing board, the city planned to build a first-class cultural facility. And by 1997, the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao had been realised. According to the Financial Times, in its first three years, the museum had helped generate about 500 million in economic activity, and the city was well on the way to recovery. On seeing what some describe as the titanium arch, arch, artichoke, I knew I'd get that wrong, other le industry leaders are saying, we want one of those. And people are traveling from all over the world to seriously consider the unique architecture. The Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao has now celebrated many years of extraordinary success, with hundreds of exhibitions and millions of visitors to its credit. This museum has changed the way people think about museums of art, as it continues to challenge assumptions about the connections between art, architecture and collecting. The Bilbao effect is often touted as a desirable model for cities suffering from irrelevance and without enough sparkle to move the tourists. We are inspired by the investment in architecture, the collections which it houses in its profile. Bilbao has proven once and for all that the art museum can make a difference. So can a private museum make a difference? Yes, it can and yes, it has in Tasmania. The recently established Museum of New and Old Art, otherwise known as MONA, was the brainchild of David Walsh, a passionate art collector whose area of interest includes ob objects relating to sex and death. His museum is comfortably situated on a cliff face in Berrydale, Hobart, Tasmania. When he was invited to share his thoughts at the opening of the official launch, he was quoted as saying, no, I'm not, that's it. And that was as close as anyone came to opening speeches for that particular event. Mona's attendance figures are healthy and as one of only a handful of private museums to be developed in this country, he has the critics and public asking for more. Will this be museum become a viable and sustainable business in the future? Does it need to be? It's really someone's private collection made public. We will re never really know the extent of the investment. No government funding and no sponsorship. Mona is free for every Tasmanian and thousands of interstate tourists are flocking to Hobart 
to see what the conversation is about. A museum that specialises in provocative and thought-provoking art has emerged and Mona has arguably become one of Tasmania's major tourist destinations. In just under a year after opening, 330,000 locals and interstate visitors had travelled across the headland of the Duant River to experience and understand this new phenomenon and a private collection valued at over 100 million. This model is rare in Australia, but nothing is as tantalising as a private collection made public. As David Walsh maintains his enigmatic profile and individualistic approach, we, the public, are constantly tempted to travel to see it once, twice and then again. And as Mona's profile continues to grow, the state of Tasmania, its cities and towns, can bask in its glory while the business community and the state's leaders work out how to best leverage off what has fast become an international cultural tourist destination. This is a good problem. So the Bendigo effect. Because on a smaller scale and, and relative to the size of this city, our gallery has injected millions of dollars into its local community too. The once overlooked regional gallery has led the way for transformation in the sector, indeed in regional Australia. We don't expect everyone to follow suit, but what we do ask for is understanding and respect for our vision. Like Detroit, the city of Bendigo owns the art museum and its collection. But Bendigo Art Gallery has wrapped around it sufficient and solid scaffolding, which I believe will form a support structure for the future. We are importing and creating stories through our exhibition programming that have enabled us to talk to national media and to build a national profile. The incremental investment in infrastructure over many years, according to need, has given Bendigo Art Gallery a solid platform for the future. And it is programming that we are now relying upon to generate new audiences. By having a story and telling it nationally, our market reach has expanded. People power through volunteering, by employing professional staff, a robust membership, donors, supporters, sponsors, government partnerships are essential elements within the Bendigo Art Gallery vision. Essential elements to be maintained for a vibrant future. We cannot underestimate the personal and social capital, the practical outcomes associated with participation, the confidence and self-esteem that we can engender, the educational impacts, the thirst for knowledge and understanding, and ultimately the benefits for the health and well-being of this community, all of which can be derived from a connection with an art gallery alongside an understanding and appreciation of the creative process. To be specific, I will mention the Arthur Guy Painting Prize, the Paul Guest Drawing Prize, the Rod Fife Ceramic Collection, the RHS Abbott Bequest and the Grace Craig Bequest, the Howard Nathan Donation, the Francis and Harold Abbott Foundation and Bendigo Art Gallery Foundation, all in varying ways form a structure and a backbone that is, I believe, unbreakable. These philanthropic acts of generosity will remain with the gallery in perpetuity. An alignment with La Trobe University means that we have a stronger link with the tertiary sector. This higher education partnership will allow curators to become academics, academics to become curators, and such a relationship will undoubtedly foster enormous benefits for students. The exchange of knowledge with a museum of art is, I believe, the way forward for the Bendigo Art Gallery and La Trobe University to work in the future. Educational groups from primary, secondary and tertiary levels must continue to engage with the gallery. And lastly, to stand out from the abundance of museums and galleries within Australia, particularly from a regional perspective, Bendigo Art Gallery needed to find a point of difference. We couldn't compete with larger museums in a budgetary sense. However, we realised very early that if we had the capacity to attract the same level of publicity and, and our product was compelling, we would succeed. Whilst the permanent collection has always offered an eclectic and considered experience for our visitors, international exhibitions were introduced into the program more than a decade ago and the gallery has led in this area with great acclaim 
and firmly posi positioned itself as a leader in the sector. Tourists, day trippers, short break visitors flock to our exhibitions and come for repeat visitation. One person recently said, it didn't matter what was on, I will be back, because the exhibitions are always a delight. If you see streams of people walking from the Bendigo station making a beeline for the gallery, taking all the parking in the QEO, booking out our accommodation, booking out our restaurants and our cafes, it may be, see, be perceived for some as a problem, but again, it's a good problem. Tourists spend money. They provide commercial activity which enhances confidence and optimism for a city. We know that the social benefits of having a museum of art within a community are great, and yet they are immeasurable. The intangible benefits are unconvincing for many. So we have a tendency to default to the economic argument, and this gives us a measurable case to go forward when we are trying to convince government, community leaders, potential donors, sponsors, and our public of our worth. But as we cultivate culture, and sell it for its economic potential only. We are not creating a sustainable model for the future unless we underpin our vision with the community and mirror the aspirations of our city. A building that will adequately house the collection is important, and yes, there will always be the potential to generate income and economic benefits for the community. But build an organisation that a city can feel proud of, that the people can own, Base this on the premise that art and cultural heritage doesn't belong to the city the way a fleet of council vehicles does. It belongs to the people. Irrelevance is death in my industry. A museum of art should be a hub of creative thought, a place for dialogue and debate. It can provide a window to the world through its education and it can look at the past, look at the present and look to the future. Importantly, it should be a cultural institution that makes its community proud because civic pride and self-esteem are the keys to a happy and healthy city. And lastly, you are only successful if someone knows about it. So don't be afraid to tell your story, your local story, nationally. Take your story to the nation and link the organisation to an international network, which is what we've done at the gallery. Think big have a can-do approach, and importantly, don't be afraid to think outside of the original charter that brought your organisation into being. Only then will you start to survive in the cutthroat world of museums. Thank you.